We want to welcome all of His Glory Nation from east to west to north to south as we continue our series in the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Here we are uh, coming to the end of our study of the book of Revelation and how important that uh, is edification for us today. It's amazing. We're going to talk about the new heaven and the new earth here in chapter 21 where we enter into eternity. Remember last chapter we talked about, um, or God talked about, the six uh, statements of a millennial reign. That was the Davidic covenant that Jesus Christ would come and fulfill this according to scripture. And this is indeed what he happened. And we see at the end of uh, chapter 20 that the white throne judgment is upon and the books are open. And those who uh, remove their own names from the Lamb's book of life were put to the lake of fire and we enter into no more time and space. We enter into eternity. And this is eternity is gonna have something amazing for those who are in the United States of America who are debating whether you should have a wall based on the Bible and who can come into these walls and who can come into these gates. And we're gonna see that heaven and eternity has a wall. And heaven and eternity, you have to be a citizen of the Most High God with extreme vetting through the heart, through the love of Jesus Christ. So we're gonna get into this and show you why why would you need walls and why why would you need that in eternity? We'll explain all to this and how God does things for a memorial. And that's a lot of a lot of reasons why pastors and theologians have a hard time struggling with the millennial reign. Well, why would God go back and, and sacrifice of the animal? Why are they gonna build a third temple? Why does Ezekiel say there's gonna be a fourth temple? Why would there be sacrificing of animals when Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice and replaced the law? No, he didn't. He overcame the law that through his grace, we could live through him by being nailed to the cross and we trust in him. But the ceremonial and the sacrifices and the memorials will continue to go. That's why they do Passover continuing. They're, Moses is not going back to Egypt and passing over all over again. God uses this as an everlasting memorial so that you remember the times that I brought you out of Egypt. You remember the times where the sacrifice of an animal replaced the sacrifice of my son. And you'll remember the times that the Lamb of God took away the sins of the earth. So God is all about his, his seven festivals. Those three festivals will continue into eternity. We have the Passover, so for eternal life, we will be celebrating the Passover lamb of Moses and how deep it goes, not only the Passover to bring them out of Egypt and bondage, but also how that was God pointing to his only begotten son to be the lamb of God. We then go into what is called Shabbat on the Hebrew calendar. That's the day God gave Moses the, the 10 commandments on Mount Sinai. It's also the same day that, which is called Pentecost. And that means 50, the 50 days under the law from Passover is Pentecost. And that is the day the church had the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit came and the church was born. So that's the second festival. And the third festival we will be uh, celebrating for eternity is the festival we're talking about now. Once we go into eternal life, it will be called the Feast of Tabernacles. We will be tabernacling literally with the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So God's seven festivals will always keep in for, for eternity. And it's important to know where we stand on the, uh, the, 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 on the, seven, uh, the seven festivals. Because Jesus has literally fulfilled four of the festivals. He will fulfill all seven in a literal sense. So how do we do that before we get into Revelation 21 and kind of give you a, your, your, wrap your mind around why God is doing what he's doing? Festival number one falls into three different categories. It falls into the Passover lamb, which was the week of first fruit. Christ is the first fruit, which came up on the Sunday. You're supposed to give the first tithe, the first fruit to the Lord. And it was a week of unleavened bread. You were required to have no leaven in the bread because bread is, uh, leaven is a symbol of sin. And the yeast will rise, or the sin rises, it puffs up in pride and spreads throughout the, 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 the children of Israel and the church. So that's the three festivals in one. And the fourth is, as we said earlier, Shabbat or Pentecost. Jesus fulfilled that. He says, I go away to sit at the right hand of the Father, but I send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to start his church, his ecclesia. He is the head of the church. We are, we are the body. So Jesus has literally fulfilled the first four. He's got three more to fulfill. And the one we're going to talk about today or today will be the seventh one. We will tabernacle with the Lord 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit outside of time and space. There's no time and space anymore. There, there's no, we don't keep time in a, in, a, in, a, in a human sense, and we'll explain that. So the next uh, festival on the calendar for the Lord is the Harpazo of the Church, and it ties into our study of the, the Church of Philadelphia. It's called the Feast of Shofars, and the shofar is blown. That's the fifth, that fifth, and that's Jesus will literally come back from his church. That's a symbol of Jesus coming back for the church because this is the only time, similar to the wedding supper of the, or the wedding ceremony in ancient Israel in the church of Philadelphia. When the new moon comes on the Feast of Trumpets or the Feast of Shofars, you have to have two witnesses and it can fall within a 48 hour window. So you never know the time or the hour that the Feast of Shofars is actually gonna fall into place fulfilling the, 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 the Israeli, um, Israel's tradition of the, the bride having to be ready for the bridegroom could come at any time based on the parable that Jesus talked about. It was, it was Israeli tradition or Hebrew tradition that the bridegroom could come back anytime within a 48 hour window and the bride had to be ready. If she wasn't ready with her lamp lit, he wasn't take, taking her home. But the, the, the five virgins who had their lamps lit, meaning filled with the light of the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, anxiously waiting his return, never denying his word, he takes him up to the wedding supper of the Lamb. So that's what it means. So that's when Jesus says, you will not know the time or the hour of the harpazo. And that is true based on the Feast of Shofars and the, the wedding ceremony tradition of the bridegroom coming in with a 48 hour window. He's very specific, not the, the day or the hour, but he wants us to know the seasons. And then the, the sixth on the festival is a, a day of atonement. That's where Jesus will make atonement for blood. And what does he make atonement for blood? Is the last chapter before we go into the millennial reign, so that would have been chapter 19, uh, where Jesus comes back as the Goel. He is the blood redeemer. And it's making the atonement of the blood. Remember in 19, we were talking about, when, when are you gonna come, Lord? When are you gonna come? When are you gonna make it righteous? And he comes and ends the Antichrist. He ends the false prophet and he ends Satan. And he puts an end to, uh, to the kings of the East and all the, 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 those who live for themselves. So that's called the Day of Atonement. And that is only on the Israeli calendar or the Hebrew calendar would be the only day of the year where you could go into the high priest, into the Holy of Holies and uh, give a sacrifice for the, un uh, the, the undone sins of the nation or the unintentional sins of the nation. We don't need that anymore because we, our high priest broke the curtains to the Holy Holy and our high priest is in the order of Melchizedek today. But we will still in the millennial reign have the Aaron so, as, a, as, a, as a, remote, a remember of memorial. And that's a way that to feed, feed the, the, the tribe of the Levites as well. So a lot of people get that confused. Why would God continue to do that? Because he keeps his tradition and keeps it so that we'll always remember the stages of sin and the law and what we had to overcome through his love to be with him for eternity. That's just absolutely amazing how precise God is. So we're looking on the prophetic calendar for the fifth. And why is the Harpazo five? It's grace. It's grace, and it's only by his grace can we be harpazoed by the condition of one's heart. Okay, so we're going to see walls here. We're going to see extreme bedding here. Remember, the only way to get to eternal life through the Most High God, through his son Jesus Christ, is to give up self and go through one door, the shepherd's door. And it's fully vetted, and it has walls. And we're going to see even heaven has walls as a memorial. And we'll go into more depth with that. So those uh, politicians and people who are taking the Bible out of context just for their political ideology uh, may want to listen to Revelation 21 as we begin and the, as what the Lord tells us. Okay, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So remember that this up until this time, there was the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now we've the white throne judgment is done. Now we are entering into eternal life. That means time is going to st stop in the normal sense, and we'll explain why with no sun and moon. So a new heaven and a new earth, for those who are in climate change, yes, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. The old earth will, will wear out. It is thin and wear out like a garment, as Isaiah says. God has promised us a new heaven and a new earth, and a new Jerusalem coming from the third heaven down to the earth. Remember, that was Jesus' prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want what is in the third heaven to come to the earth for eternity. And God is answering that prayer through 
this chapter of the Bible today. The, for the first, and the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. First, uh, the first heaven is the earth, the second heaven is the stars and the planets, and the third heaven is where God's throne is with Jesus Christ today. But he will create it all in one that we will be together with the Lamb and the Father and the Holy Spirit forever. And there's no more sea. Why does he say sea? There's no sea. There's three things missing from this chapter in Revelation 21 and eternity. And we'll explain them when they, when they go. But first, here's the sea. Sea is always an idiom throughout the, the scripture. Again, expositional constancy is just a fancy theological term to say the Holy Spirit is always consistent in its symbols, its idioms, its colors, its numbers. Everything means something. Sea is always a reference to the second death, the death, the sea swallowed up the, the death. And that is to the, to the literal hole, to the literal uh, compartment of Sheol and the pit or Hades. And that will be done away with because we'll have a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more uh, Sheol anymore. And there will be no more sea because those who have denied the Lord are into a whole new compartment called the lake of fire. They have been taken out of Sheol or Hades. And since there is no death, the, those who love the Lord with all their heart, their soul, and their mind entering into eternity... Death has been conquered. There is no more sea. There is no more death. Just living water, the living river of, the, of, 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 of God himself. So that's why there's no more sea. And we'll see that there's no more sun and there's no more moon. And there's a dual purpose for that. Well, at least a dual purpose. God's so advanced. There's a gazillion purposes for it that, what, that he will explain to us in, uh, in heaven when we get there. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, his beloved for anybody not to think that the city of Jerusalem belongs to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God through David, the God of the Messiah, this is showing you that Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that comes out of heaven, will sit in his holy spot for eternity. It, it is the eternal home, not just of Israel, not just of the Messiah, not just of the Abrahamic covenant, not just of the Davidic covenant, but every tribe, tongue, and nation who accept the Lord Most High through His Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord of their life, no matter what color tongue you, you, you speak or tribe, we are all one. We are all called sons and daughters of the Most High God. And it's based on our red blood. It doesn't matter our skin color. It doesn't matter what we speak. We're all brothers and sisters based on blood. And quite uh, figuratively, or quite literally, we're all tied into three unique DNA strands anyway. Whether you're white or you're, you're brown or whatever, you're, you're black or whatever color you are, we come from three DNA strands, which literally comes from one DNA, stands from DNA strands, that's Noah. Noah had three sons, and Shem, Japheth, and Ham. We are all from that. So we're all literally brothers of blood all the way back. All of our bloodlines go back to Noah and to the three sons of Noah. So when we get here, it's a spiritual and a literal bloodline will be confirmed. And the Messiah literally had to come from the line of David, the bloodline of David, David to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse to fulfill Bible prophecy. So the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from Theos, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the holy matrimony that no divorce will ever come in. This is, this is the significance of a dual covenant here. Remember through the Old Testament, if you read the Old Testament very clearly, and that's why to understand the book of Revelation, you have to know the Old Testament. There's over 843 references in the, in the book of Revelation from the Old Testament. Every book of the Old Testament is in the book of Revelation. So if you don't know the Old Testament, you're not going to be able to understand the book of Revelation. So what he's saying is a dual covenant. Remember God the Father all through the Old Covenant says, my bride is Jerusalem. She played a harlot. He was always talking about Israel playing a harlot or Judah playing a harlot, but it was always as truly as his, his, he was married to his beloved city, Jerusalem, where he puts his peg. And she went against him. And now the bride will re be redeemed. She'll be washed as pure. She'll be a virgin once again. So that represents a dual covenant, a covenant of the Old Covenant, through the city of Jerusalem of God restoring his bride for eternity through the Jewish faithful. And also God restoring through his son, Jesus Christ, the bridegroom to the bride, which is the church, fulfilling both covenants here 
and the city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, where the king of kings and lord of hosts will reign for eternity. Remember, eternity is, 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 is forever. There is no more time. We're not keeping time. We're not aging. We're in a glorified body, and we are with the Most High God, and we're going to see how glorious it is as we go. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Theos is with man. So remember I said earlier that when we go into eternity, that will literally fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles. Here it is. We're tabernacling with Theos is with man. And he will dwell with them and he shall be his people. So God is dwelling with us in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, fulfilling the last of the festivals, completion, tabernacling with the Lord for eternity. Theos himself will be with them and he will be their Theos. He will be our God. He will be with us. It will be like it was with them, Adam and Eve, but there's no forb forbidden fruit any longer. He's paid the price through his son, Jesus Christ, and the Trinity we reign with in a perfect body, a glorified body, and a, and a dimensionality that only he is. It is absolute beyond beautiful. Heaven beyond heaven. It's going to be glorious. Verse 4. And Theos will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. They've died. They've passed away. So this is a real deep message here. We'll have tears in heaven when you go to the Bema Seat, if you're of the Lord. You'll have initial tears of regret. You'll have tears of regret when you see the Bema Seat, the things that you may have not done in the name of the Lord. You'll have tears of maybe of not of saving a family member or a friend because you were too busy or didn't want to uh, take the time or were embarrassed to share your testimony with them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that would be that moment of tear in, on the Bema seat that you, you did not fulfill what God wanted you to do in your life. You'll be in heaven, but that will be that tear of regret. But he's going to wipe those away. And he says, everything will die. Every, all the sorrow, all the pain. So there'll be no more sorrow. We won't be worrying anymore. We won't be frantic anymore. We're not going to worry about bills. We're not going to worry about wars. We're not going to worry about uh, the things that we worry about every single day. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more hurt and pain. And those loved ones that we had that did not make it, this is where theologians will disagree, but it's my strong conjecture that the Lord wipes your memory clean of those who are removed from the Lamb's Book of Life. Why? Because it wouldn't be eternal life in heaven if you knew a loved one didn't get there. You would have that, 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 that sorrow. And he says those things passed away. Everything passed away, it's gone. So if you passed away, it died. So if it died, it died to the second death. All these things died to the second death. And they were away from the Lord for eternity. And remember, as we said, they chose to remove their, their names from the Lamb's Book of Life. They're in the lake of fire, but their names were removed from the Lamb's Book of Life, and only the Lamb's Book of Life will be here. So we will only know of the Lamb's Book of Life at this point. So the memory will be wiped away. So then he who sat on the throne, behold, I will make all things new. Everything will be new in his perfect glory. You know, the heaven, as Paul said in, first, in Corinthians, no eye is seen, no ear is heard, no mind can conceive. What God has in store for those that love him, and this will be part of those promises, when I had a taste of heaven, it was absolutely incredible. Absolutely, I can't even put it into words. I was like the Apostle Paul. It was this unconditional love and light and brightness and comfort. Everything smelled better, tasted better, looked better, felt better. It was just, it was perfection. I didn't want to go back. And this is the way heaven's going to be, but even more glorious that we can't even put into words that we'll be tabernacling for eternity with the Lord. Then he sat at the throne, and I'll make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So he told John, write these things so that we can study these today on this day in July 17th of 2018 that we will know where our home is for eternity once we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord of our life and we walk in truth and faithful. And he says, these words are true and faithful. The only thing that's true and faithful in this world of fake church, fake news, fake politicians, fake everything, is the living word of God, which is truly, literally, Jesus Christ. And he's going to fulfill that. Uh, verse 6, And he said to me, It is done. It's over. We have come back full circle from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden all the way back to eternity to be with 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is complete. It is done. We usher in to his eternal kingdom and the glory for him forever, and no sin is around anymore, and we are just in his Shekinah, his Kavod, his Doxa, his literal essence forever. Wow, what a day. What a day that shall be, and that day will never end. That day will be the greatest day that you've ever had on your life, in your life, times a gazillion, and it will never end. Can you imagine that? Think about in, the, in your life the greatest day you ever had, and you times that by a gazillion, literally, and, a, and that day will never end. That's how glorious. It's just giving a smidgen how glorious eternal life is going to be. And he said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will, will give the fountain of the water of life freely to those who thirst. Who can do that? Only Christ. Remember the, the woman at the well? She says, are you, are you better than our father Jacob? He built these walls. He says, woman, I'm the one they're talking about. I give you a water that you'll never thirst again. Where is this water you're talking about? He is that water. He is the living water. And we will be in that living water that will never thirst again because he's completed and quenched our thirst forever in a Shekinah glory. He overcomes shall inherit all these things. We have to overcome, as the Apostle Paul says, finish the race in the name of his glory. Even if we have to hobble, crawl, just get over the line in the name of his glory. And you shall inherit all these things that the Lord is sharing with us in Revelation 21. And I will be his Theos, and he shall be my son. So he who enters in and finishes it and comes into the eternal things, we will be called sons and daughters of the Most High for eternity. And that is something that can't be revoked. It's with him perfectly. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, adulterers, and liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So those who denied into iniquity, the, you know, all of us have done these things in our life, but we've asked for forgiveness first and salvation. And while we're walking in salvation, we are going to trip up. And that's what 1 John 1, 9 is. And uh, that's called the Christian's bar of soap. And when we, are, when we fall, we, we ask for forgiveness for the Lord and he's faithful and he will heal us and we will sin no more. We'll get right back on the right track. He's referring to people who have iniquity in their hearts that have denied the Lord. They will not be in Sheol anymore, as it says. They have gone to the second death. They are in a new dimensionality of a literal lake of burning fire and brimstone for eternity based off what they chose with their own heart and living in this world instead of living for your heart for the Most High through His Son, Jesus Christ. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls, seven again, completion, with seven last plates came to me and talked to me saying, come, I will show you the bride and the lamb's wife. Wow, the bride, the bride and the lamb's wife. It's calling two different things. Israel and the church, mutually exclusive, but through one lamb, one Messiah. And he is going to fulfill as to be the bridegroom to both being God and the son of God and the Holy Spirit, fulfilling both covenants. Yeah, absolutely amazing. We will be married with a with a, with a bridegroom or the, the 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 head of the church Christ as the bride to the bridegroom for eternity. We will be married, and it will be perfect marriage. It will be love and harmony, and no fights, no hurt, no nothing. It's just all things for His purpose and His love and His glory. And we will be in His essence. And He carried away to the Spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the great things of the city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from Theos. So he took John up under the high mountain and was able to take him into a dimensionality that looked to the things that were going to come because he's the Alpha and the Omega, the Alpha and the Tav in the Hebrew, the A to the Z in the English, and the beginning and the end. So he was showing John what things would happen in the end days of a literal new Jerusalem coming down and the Lord revamping the earth to a new heaven and a new earth for the first and second heaven. Having the glory of God, the doxa, his glory, his essence. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper uh, stone, clear and crystal. It's purity. There's no more sin. 
Everything is pure. And all the elements and sparkling and, and the stones and everything that was from the Old Testament of the stones that were on the high priest, the stones that were in the heavenly realm that Isaiah and Ezekiel saw are coming to the earth because the glory of God, where you see the glass and the pure gold of the streets, it looks like glass because everything is so pure. Even the gold in its complete purity is so clear, you can see it like glass. Verse 12, and she had a great and high wall with 12 gates. Whoa, wait a minute. For those who are trying to create their ideology in the, in the political world today, this is eternal life and God has a wall and there's 12 gates. And in case you're wondering, we go into the Greek and see what the Greek word for high wall is. The Greek means a literal wall. So there is a wall. Why does God do this? Because there's not going to be any, uh, you know, there's nobody coming in to take over his kingdom. It's an everlasting memorial. This is based on the 12 tribes of Israel. It's based on the 12 apostles, which we're going to see. It's going to be based on the holy city. It's going to be based on the temple of, at, throughout the uh, Old Testament. It's confirming the New Testament and the Old Testament coming together as one. As you said, that, as you'll see that there is four gates uh, and th th three at each gate representing the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 is the completion to the nation of Israel, always throughout the scripture. So there was 12 gates. That's why God has 12 gates. And 12 angels at the gate and the name written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So the 12 gates, 12 angels, and the, and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, the, the, the triple, the trinity of the 12, if you will. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Why does that matter? That's fulfilling exactly how God told Moses to build the tabernacle. Remember, the tabernacle was a portable tabernacle to the Lord. This was a portable, this was a for a, a, a time that was in a replica of what was in heaven. This time it will be heaven on earth, literally a new heaven and a new earth. And what he, how he set the tribes up, you would have three tribes exactly like this in the tabernacle in the Torah. Three to the east, three to the west, uh, three to the north, three to, to the south. That's why we always say east, west, north, and south when we open up every one of them. That represents God put the three tribes on four. So there was four, four sides, three tribes each, and that was where they got the symbols. The same symbols of the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle as it was that Isaiah and Ezekiel saw, and as what God showed them as the emblem of the 12 tribes of Israel being fulfilled here. All the old and the new are coming together to fulfill his entire love covenant with his people. Praise his name. So for those, again, thinking there's no place for Israel, uh, you're missing the whole purpose of, not the whole purpose, but the twelves in Revelation 21 and the 12 tribes of Israel. They're Jewish. The 12 apostles, they're Jewish. Our Messiah is Jewish. We have a Hebrew God who is the God of all people at this particular time. He's modeling the city after the old, the, the old tabernacle and also how he told Moses to set up the tribes on the gates, exactly the way the Lord said in the Old Testament. As Jesus said, I didn't come in Matthew 5, 17 and 18. I didn't come to replace Moses and the prophets. I came to fulfill it to every yacht and tittle, dot the I, cross the T. God is dotting the I and crossing the T through Jesus Christ right now for eternity, exactly the way he said. God has still has a place for eternity with Israel and for everyone who is not Jewish through the, the Lamb the blood of the lamb. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Again, 12 is the number of completion of Israel, 12 foundations. And these were the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. Again, 12, so we got five 12s so far, that's grace. And 12 again is the completion of the nation of Israel. And we will talk, and he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls. So, so he's, God's a builder. He, he, he's a developer. He's developing uh, the wall in the city, and he's telling him to get a precise gold rod to measure it according to what God has said the dimensions should be of this eternal wall. There will be a wall for eternity. People say, will they build a wall? They may not build a wall in the United States of America, but there will be a wall in eternity because we're seeing it here. And you have to be extremely vetted to get in. It's only through the shepherd's gate and the love of Jesus Christ to get in. And we're going to see only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life can enter into the wall. So that means you have to be a citizen of heaven 
through Jesus Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit to enter in, extreme vetting. And to be a legal citizen, we only become legal citizens because of the condition of our heart and accepting Christ as our Lord of our life. And the city is laid out as a square. So there's a big square here. So it's, it's length and width is going to be 1,400 miles in the, in, in the English. But what does God tell us in the furloughs, in the original Greek? 12,000 furloughs, its length, breadth, height are equal. Everything is equal. So it tw it tw uh, 12,000 furloughs. 12 again, the completion of Israel. That's why God is telling us in furlough, some of yours might say 1,400 miles. You want to go with a translation of what God actually said of the Greek, and it's 12,000 furloughs because he's trying to show you the exact number, what he means, the consistency of the number 12. Then he measured the wall. Oh, there's a wall. How far? I don't know what uh, America's trying to build a wall. I think somebody said 20 or 30 feet. Let's see how high the wall is. Again, it's 1,400 miles long and that way. This is a big, big, big wall. This would be uh, all the way from uh, Michigan or Ohio all the way down to Florida. So this, and, and then going all the way, it'd probably take up a, a good chunk of the United States. Uh, so the, he measured 144 cubics. So they're going to measure the wall. Remember a cubit in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament, the first covenant? Well, a cubit was from the tip of the finger to the right elbow, would be the general, but uh, basically most scholars would say it's about 18, uh, 18, uh, 18 inches. But God is telling us 144 cubits for a reason. Some of your uh, Bibles may say 200 feet. So in the English, uh, what we measure as, me uh, as measurement in the English in the Western world, that means it's a 200 foot wall. I mean, that is a big, big wall. I, as a, a former Marine, had to scale down a 100 foot wall and that was a tough one to look down to and, and, per and uh, scale down to it. Um, shimmy down as we had to learn how to do, but 200 feet, that is incredibly high wall. Again, God is showing it for his purpose and his glory to show as a memorial. That's why he's doing it. There's nobody going to invade him because it's the eternal life. But he's showing you every step of the way that mankind had to go and every step of the way God rescued mankind throughout the entire world age or the human age, the earth age, because earth is gone now. It's a new heaven. There is, we're in heaven now. The heaven of the third and the first and the second are combined into one with his Shekinah glory, his kavod. But why did he say 144? Because that goes back to uh, what we studied early. 12 tribes of Israel, each one of the 12 tribes had 12,000. And 12 times 12 is 144. So he's again confirming the number 12 and the 144 that went out in the book of Revelation to Israel again. Again, we're seeing a theme over and above how God has a plan for eternal life for Israel and also his beloved. We all become one. Um, then he measured the wall, 144 cubits, according to the measurement of man, that is of an angel. So wait a minute. The, the Greek word here, this is very fascinating. And uh, th this is, uh, nobody talks about this. I've never heard of a a commentary in the book of Revelation talk about what he just said. You can skip over this real quick and say, uh, the measure of a man that is of an angel. Is he saying the same thing twice? No, you gotta go look at the Greek. What is he saying in the Greek? He, the, the, the Greek word for man is literally a man. So he's talking about man who's been redeemed and an eternal life and we have a glorified body, we're with Christ. The next is, it could be, it's called ang angelos in the, in the Greek. Uh, it can be translated as a literal angel creation by God or it can be considered a messenger. Here it is referring to the angels. So it's saying we will be dwelling with the angels. Wow, we don't talk about the angels anymore. You ever wondered when we go into eternal life, where's God's angels? Here they are, they're with us. They're with us. And some scholars will even tell you that goes further based off the book of Enoch in the scripture tells us that we will actually uh, judge the angels. Enoch, according to the book of Enoch, uh, is in charge of the angels in heaven today. So uh, as the scripture tells us that we will be in charge of, 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 of angels, but we will be dwelling with God's other creation, his angels as well. We will see Michael and we will see Gabriel and we will see the cherubs and we'll see the seraphim and we'll see the different ranks of angels and being in one brotherhood of angel and man and God's eternity 
his, all his family and all his creation. We're just a different creation than the angels, but we will be all one. Just amazing. And the angels, they, they, they look at us and they go, wow, look what man has to go through. Look what man's got to go through to get to this place. And sometimes they, they, they're interceding for us. That's why God's got some really great angels that love God. But they see what man has to go through every single day. And they're amazed and they're willing to help God help us get to where we need to go because they're servants. And that's what a servant will do. Praise, praise the name of the Most High. The construction of the wall was jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. If you, Scott, um, experts will tell you if you get a absolutely perfect gold, it is clear as glass. And that's exactly what it is. This will, again, take the, 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 the stones of the, of the high priest, the stones of the tribes of Israel, all going to be a part of God's holy city for eternity. The foundations of the wall were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. It would just be glorious, just absolutely sparkling and just radiant and just filled with love. Everything is just going to be glorious. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third colonian, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardux, the sixth asardius, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth christophrase, the eleventh jacob, and the twelfth amethyst. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. So again, the 12 stones, again, that's what the, the high priest would have the 12 stones, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, God is talking about 12 as a completion to the nation of Israel. We are all completed through Father Abraham here through the covenant of the Abrahamic covenant and all the way back to Adam, who is the second Adam, Jesus Christ, God's completion of now his beloved. All of us are called his beloved. But I saw uh, in the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. So the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Over the 12 gates, there were 12 pearls. There's a problem with this according to the law. A pearl came from a, a, a uh, creature that was unkosher. You were not to, to eat of that. That was against the uh, dietary law. But God, through Jesus Christ, that Jesus said, what goes into the mouth is not what defiles and what comes out of the mouth is the condition of one's heart so the dietary law was replaced by christ therefore pearls which are they're not kosher are on every one of the gates letting know that the, the the gentiles have been cleansed as well and the gentiles are joining the 12 tribes and the bride the church is is, is forming with israel all loving the one bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Mutually exclusive, but one door, the shepherd's door, and that is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Praise his name. Absolutely detailed how God is. But I saw no temple in it. Why is there no temple? I mean, Jesus says, what? You worship, you worship the things in the temple more than who dwells in the temple. They were worshiping the, 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 the outwardly ways in the first covenant or the Old Testament instead of God's essence anyway. So what does God do here in Revelation 21? It says there's no temple anymore. I am the temple. I am the holy of holies, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is no temple. It's me, my Son, and the Holy Spirit forever. Praise the name of his glory. But I saw no temple in it for the Lord God. Kairos Theos Almighty, no one higher, and the Lamb are his temple, the Lamb of God, the Christ, the Messiah, dwelling in the middle and with us, and their light shining forever. What a glorious. This is why we go through life, to get to this point, and it chokes me up so much. What God has in store for you, just love him, trust him, because that's where our home's going to be. And his word is truth, and it's glorious. The city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it. Why? Because the light of the, of the light of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there's a dual meaning to this as well. For the doxa of God, the glory, his literal essence, the literal essence of Theos, the Trinity, will shine the light over the entire new heaven. Illuminated, the Lamb is light. They're both light. All parts of the Trinity are light. There is no sun or moon. So that means we're tabernacling with the Lord outside of time and space. Remember, in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ is the 7,000th year. 1,000 years, he's very specific, as we said. It's, it, it means what he says and says what he means. 
and that is completion seven is completion after the end of the millennial reign. Then we usher outside of time and space. We are in no time anymore. Remember that you keep time and seasons in the world today based on a solar calendar or a lunar calendar. So if you don't have a sun and a moon, you can't keep time anymore. And we're outside of time and space and we're tabernacling with the Lord. So there's no more time and space. We'll see in chapter 22 how we keep time. It will be of the, le it will be of the leaves of each month that heal the nations where we will know any essence of time. So we'll be in a Bible study with the Lord and be in glory and we won't say, oh, beep, it's time to go. We got to go pick up our kids or got to go to band practice or we got to go to football practice. No, we're with the Lord forever and time is just, it doesn't matter. We're just in his, his, his glory. And when you're in the glory of the Lord, do you ever, ever want to leave? No, you don't want your alarm clock to wake you up if you're having a prophetic dream. If you're in, a, in your prayer closet with the Lord and you feel the Holy Spirit on you, you don't want your alarm to go off and say, hey, it's time to go make dinner. You want to be in his Shekinah glory, his kavod, his doxa forever so that no time can stop you. And that's where we're going to the God illuminated. Verse 24. And the nations of those who saved shall walk in the light and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor to it. It's not the same thing twice, as we said. We'll see the, in the next chapter where the, there'll be leaves each month, the healing of the nations. It's not a person, but a physical landmass will need to be healed. We know Egypt will take, a, I, think, I believe, a, a period of the Old Testament, 30 or 40 years to heal the land of Egypt. Uh, Babylon will never be healed. It will be uh, no more. But the nations, the physical land masses itself have sinned against the Lord and there will be a punishment. And here, some of the nations have not physical land masses and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. So we're in a d dimensionality we can't even fathom. Remember when Jesus said you can tell that mountain to go there? That's not a figure of speech because he's telling you right here, the nations are gonna be saved. How we're gonna see this is beyond anything we can comprehend in our mind because we live in a three and a half world, a three and a half dimensionality. God is an infinite dimensionality. Scientists today say we're in at least 10 dimensions. And some are saying we're in 20. So these things are gonna be literal and the mountains will move when we tell them to move because God is telling us in the second, in the next verse, or in the same verse, the kings of the earth bring glory and honor to it. So you'll have charge over the mountains. You'll have charge over the angels. We, call, we are called to be kings and priests of the Most High God based on what we did in the world through our boot camp. Again, salvation gives us eternal life, asking the Lord, repenting of our sins and accepting him as Lord of our Savior. What we do from that point on, it's called the sanctification, fulfilling God's purpose of our life, will put us, our, our, our position in the millennial reign, but also our position in eternal life. God ranks everything and has, has people in positions based on what they did for him for his purpose and his glory, not for works, for love of him. So there will be kings, literal kings that are of us human beings that will be in charge of literal mountains, literal nations, and will have the authority to make them move exactly the way Jesus said. Nothing in the, in the Bible is a, is, is a figure of speech. God is outside of time and space and he can literally make these things happen. And we know the nations will have to be healed. So these nations have been saved and will be able to walk in the light but they will be put under the kings of the earth at this particular time, which will be of the Lord. So this is showing you tabernacling because in the Old Testament, kings and priests had to be separated. You couldn't have the, the priesthood of the Levites with the, with, with the tribe of Judah uh, and kings. You got separated. In the, in the uh, new covenant with Christ, we'll be called kings and priests of the Most High. He'll combine them both in the order of Melchizedek, king and lord of righteousness so that we'll be combined to be able to be a, a priestly line and a kingly line of the Most High through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It will absolutely be beyond anything our mind can comprehend. Science is starting to give us a little bit of a glimmer of what this is. And again, if you listened to you know, Paul and, and my near-death experience, you just can't put into words how glorious it is. It's just the feelings and the seeings and the smells and everything is just so glorious. And I just got a smidgen of what it's gonna be. It is absolutely worth everything we go through. That's why he's saying, hold on. Don't deny my name. Don't deny my word. Finish the race. Overcome, because I got a great place for you, because you love me.
and you never denied me. Here you are, son and daughter, welcome into my kingdom. Not only welcome into my kingdom, but I'm making you a king and priest because why? You trusted me. You trusted me like Abraham trusted me. You trusted me like David trusted me. You trusted me like Daniel trusted me. You trusted me like Paul trusted me. Yes, you were fallen because every one of them were fallen. But the difference is they got back up, repented, sought your face, and were obedient to your word and finished the race for your glory. That's how you'll be a king and priest. We don't do it for the works. We don't do it for the crowns. We do it for love. It's the love that compels us. Abraham didn't do it because he was going to get something from God. He did it because he loved God. He trusted God. He had faith in God. And he was obedient to God, even to take Isaac up to Mount Moriah because he knew God would stand by his everlasting covenant that it would be through Isaac and then Jacob forever. God means what he says and says what he means. And Moses knew that. Abraham knew that. And they trusted him. And that's why Abraham was credited to him to be righteous. He had faith, love, trust, and obedience. That's what he's asking us today. And that's where you will be in the kingdom of glory. The gates shall not shut all day. There shall be no, no night there. They won't shut. You can have entrance into the gate because you're a citizen to the most high God because your name's in the book of life. You got a passport. It says heaven forever. Lamb's book of life and your name will be there. And then your new name, as the scripture says, your new name that Christ will give you will be uh, in the Lamb's book of life saying, he is a citizen of heaven for eternity. He can walk through the gate at any time he likes because he's of the most high God. And there is no night. So it never shuts because there is no day or night. We don't keep time of day and night. We don't sleep. Can you imagine not having to sleep? I don't like to go to sleep. I don't like to sleep. I want to stay awake. I want to do things for God all the time. Can you imagine our body not wearing down? That we can just be in this glory all the time and we don't have to sleep? What a waste of time. That we have to go eight, nine hours a night, wasting our life away, sleeping. Can you imagine that we'd be with him in love, joy, peace? Remember when you were a kid and your parents let you go? It's not like this day and age. When I was a kid, if it was summertime, we'd play until the, our parents dragged us by our ears back home. It'd be midnight, it'd be one, and we'd keep going. We'd keep going until we couldn't stop. We didn't want to sleep. And that's just for a human, earthly pleasure. We had imagined the glory of God and his love, peace, joy, hope will never sleep. We'll be in his glory forever. And he shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. The glory and the honor of the nations into it, literally. It's not a figure of speech, literally. But there shall be no means, no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie. Nothing that is not in the book of the Lamb's Book of Life will enter into these. So it's extreme betting. You have to be a citizen and your name needs to be in the Book of Life. But only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So it's like coming in to become a citizen of the United States of America. Here's your passport. You're an American citizen. Big deal. I mean, that's great to be an American citizen. But we're citizens in the Lamb's Book of Life for eternity. Nobody's kicking us out. And nobody that shouldn't be there is getting in because there's an extreme vetting. We had to go through some trials and tribulations to get there. And we had to give our heart to the most high God through his son, Jesus Christ, and love. It's all about love. Love, love, love. And this is what we have to look forward to, Revelation 21. We pray that this has been a blessing to you, Revelation 21. Walls, extreme vetting, and citizenship in the Lamb's Book of Life for eternity. Nobody can revoke it. There is no time limit put on that. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you today and always. God bless you.